Hello YouTube viewers, welcome to my channel Science to Technology. In today's show, Future Friday, we're going to talk about hands-on on supercritical CO2 turbine system. I had this opportunity, so let's dive right into it. So how the heck I got the hands-on? Well, it was uh, basically put in the center of Interdisciplinary Center for Energy Research, ICER. I -C -E -R. Now, this is a sub-branch of Indian Institute of Science. And there are only few companies uh, right now that are working. Some are in USA, some are in Europe, and some, uh, one in India. And uh, I had the luxury of going there. Now, how the heck that happened? Well, simply because Merrick, uh, sir, he funded me and uh, he works as, as a like managing partner of Spectrum Impact, basically this venture capital firm. And uh, I had the luxury to go there. So I had the ability to meet some faculty who are actually working on this and also the lab visit, the actual photo. This happened on Monday, 10 October 2022. So let's dive right deep into it. So let's understand the logic. So what we are talking about here as a when you're talking about supercritical CO2 system is that closed Burton cycle with supercritical CO2. There is no phase change. Let that sink in. There is no phase change, meaning it remains in fluid. Let's just call it fluid. It remains in fluid. There is no point where it's going to gas. There is no choice where it's condensing. It's not doing phase change. It's completely opposite to how our air conditioner works, where it has evaporator, it has condensers. This is like, nope. It has nope. So it's supercritical CO2 system. So let's start the system now. Unfortunately, I was stupid. I had a better image there, like there was a physically printed copy of that. I should have taken a photo of that. Here, the engineer who was uh, showing me things around is like, yeah, it's on, available online. It was not available online. So this is the best I could find. So let's start with the starting point. So you take what we call cool supercritical CO2. Basically cool. A cool simply means ambient temperature. So you start with that cool supercritical CO2. You start here. Then main compressor adds bar to you, meaning pressure bar you add so you can start as low as like around 90 uh, you know bars and this puppy will increase this puppy to around 180 to 190 something like that so you have compressor adding pressure awesome simple then you go to recuperator now this could be called many things it simply in simplest term it is a heat exchanger what it is doing is basically taking reject wasted heat that you're supposed to dump to atmosphere it's dumping into incoming stream basically it's acting like a preheater so they call it recuperator it's adding some bit of temperature so in this axis assume that's the temperature so your temperature will go from ambient to a lot again some will happen simply because you compressed it but majority of that will happen like basically let's say your input is 150 degrees celsius your output would be around uh, 350 uh, not 350 i think 300 uh, simply because you are take, extracting heat from recuperator so you had compressor that added pressure then you had to cover that added 50 percent of the heat in terms of temperature then you had the primary heat exchanger basically this is your power plant side this is where you are burning coal to add heat this is where you are burning natural gas biogas whatever have you concentrated solar it does not make financial cell but again if you want to do it you could do it industrial heat management you can do that so now you have high pressure uh, high temperature even higher temperature and then you send it to turbine now turbine can also be inverted to call it as an expander because you send very high pressure very high temperature things there turbine turns uh, and extracts energy out of it so pressure drops so at five basically the output point your pressure will drop from like whatever the higher pressure was pressure will drop to again ba uh, back to main compressor like your pressure dropped now that pressure dropped a lot however the temperature did not drop a lot meaning uh, same way in a steam turbine you can send a very high pressure steam and output could be literally partial vacuum very high like you can be sending hundreds of psi the output could be literal uh, you know partial vacuum but your temperature would not drop that much you will still have like you know steam coming out of the other end same happens here the turbine removes a lot of psi but does as in like a lot of bars but it does not remove a lot of temperature so you still have basically the output still is hot so you send it to recuperator. Now this puppy cools itself down by dumping heat into the pre, uh, you know, preheating side. So basically this cools down, this heats up. Because this temperature is so high, elevated to around like, you know, 400, 500 degrees Celsius, you can do this quite efficiently. Higher the temperature delta, the easier the energy transfer becomes. So high, hot comes in, warm goes out, uh, warm comes in, hot goes out and then gets super hot, then it drives to turbine. So this is the main reason. Otherwise, this is would be a very dumb cycle that you see in Wikipedia. Uh, again, it can be done. It will work. It will be very inefficient. So you recuperate to that. Now, after recuperation, you have dumped majority of your heat. You are at like what we call minus 10, majority of your temperature is a lot, but you still need to drop the temperature to very low levels. So that requires cooling. Now, this would be your cooling tower. Now, again, 
this cooling tower is very efficient in this design compared to steam system simply because steam cannot effectively cool itself. So what we do is just what we utilizing what we call evaporative cooling, meaning we'll just let steam boil off. Consequence, all uh, thermal power plants drink water like there is no tomorrow. Like even if you have a nuclear power plant, you're like, dude, I'm safe. A drought happens, you're dead. Like it is a real world scenario where many coal power plant in India, be it in Faridabad, be it some in South India, where there are many power plants, like you can type it and find it out. And I can guarantee you it happened almost all around the world that many power plants had to shut down either temporarily or permanently simply because they ran out of water because they are just letting water evaporate. And these things are drink water like there is no tomorrow. So here you do not have to do that. Why? Because the temperature that is coming out of recuperator is still hot, meaning you're still talking in hundreds of degrees Celsius, uh, not hundreds as in like uh, around 150. That's why I really wished I had that graph. That graph had like really clear markings. I could have talked properly here. So that high temperature, you go to air. Now, because the temperature delta would be so high, let's say ambient in India could be uh, you know, okay day that would be around 51 degrees Celsius. Really bad day could be around 60 degrees Celsius. Again, air temperature rarely goes that hot, but that's worst case here. You would be at 110 degrees Celsius or even hotter than that. You still have enough temperature delta that energy will willingly go there. Like you don't have to like, oh, I have to let a lot of water evaporate. It's like, bro, I'm already hot. Like the hot outside air is cool to me. So it will dump all the remaining heat, heat rejection system, and then it will go to the main compressor. That's how it happens. Main compressor takes it as pressure. Then you have 50% of your heat added from recuperator. Then majority of your working heat added from your primary heat exchanger. Then turbine uh, is driven. Turbine extracts majority of the uh, basically compression. Your bar drops. Then you go back to the recuperator, dumps majority of your heat. Then dumps remaining heat into the open ambient system, basically waste heat. Then uh, going to main compressor. Now this system is shown as like you know one shaft system. It can be done. We call this sort of system a turbo expander. It is already used like this system basically main compressor and turbine putting into the same shaft is what we call turbo compressor. Uh, turbo expander used in LNG fields a lot like gas industry gas petroleum they use this like there's no tomorrow. So this would be the generator unit. It can be in one shaft. It can be designed in such a way where there are two independent units. You can have multiple compressor stage. It's up to you. This is the simplified architecture. This is the simplified variant. So be mindful temperature I'm telling you is like proportionate. So you take normal CO2, you compress the hell out of it, you preheat that puppy, then you add source heat to it, then turbine removes majority of the basically pressure from it, then recuperator dumps majority of heat from it, then you send it to cooling tower to drop the heat to a useful level, then your cool CO2 starts the turbine again. Now, uh, because of that high temperature of that, re after recuperator is still hot, it's very easy to dump heat into the ambient. Like we do the same thing in cars. Like if you go back to old cars, they had huge radiator. For the few horsepower they had, the radiators were enormous. Why? Because they were not using high pressure. Now, uh, higher the pressure, uh, you put water under, the, you know, higher temperature it takes to boil. For example, instead of boiling at 100 degrees Celsius, you can push it to 150 degrees Celsius. So if you add pressure to it, you allow the engine block to run hotter. But here's the deal. At 150, it's super easy for ambient air to take heat. Even in Indian scenario, it's like, bro, outside air is 60 degrees Celsius. Uh, the, your engine block's temperature would be 150 energy is still going out, super easy to uh, go out. So that's why we want hot side to be, like where you are dumping heat to be hot. You do not want it to be like water behaving, where it's like just evaporate boatload of it. At some point, it's almost like you are just evaporating 100% of the water. That's why like over time, it piles up. You can drink rivers dry, drain any underground water reservoir surprisingly quickly. So this whole thing, reprocreator, basically this puppy, this heat exchanger, is the core reason why this puppy can have in principle, very high efficiency. You are talking about like, um, if done theoretically best models, it should be 10 to 20% more efficient compared to a steam server. But again, that's ideal model. This is what we can build right now. I saw the small variants of this, but uh, that's how it works. You take CO2, you add compression, you add half heat, then you add full heat, then you remove compression, you remove 50% heat, then you remove re reject heat, then you repeat the cycle, completely closed loop. And many times you will see primary heat exchanger stored as a independent heat exchanger simply because everything, every uh, link that you are seeing here is a high pressure system, meaning at the lowest point, the pressure is at around 70 to 80 bars because it has to be at that point. So maintain super criticality. It cannot drop below that. So that's why everything is in closed loop. So heat exchangers have to do deal with some like extensive same. For example, you will, it's very unlikely that you're going to have like hot exhaust gas directly going into heat exchanger. Can it be done? Yes. Problem would be that uh, heat exchanger will not last if you send like raw 
raw hot exhaust of like a coal furnace directly into that while it is like at high pressure while it is at high temperature it simply won't last so you will always see there would be a, an additional circuit that uh, like you know stabilizes the system so that's the logic behind it again this is the core you will find multiple sub variants of it so what are the consequences of that? Now, consequences like the first thing that you type super critical CO2, they are like tabletop turbine, very high power turbine. And that is true. Like that's a big S turbine. This is a tiny S turbine. So it is true. Again, be mindful. I don't think they are of the same power level. This barely looks like 1 to 10 megawatt. That looks like 100 megawatt, but still exponentially smaller. And yes, if you make it that same power level, it still would be small. And by a factor of a lot, like a 10 around. So how the heck that's possible? Like if you need that huge of a turbine, how can you make that tiny? Well, here's the deal. It's almost like a transformer. Like you can increase one vector, but you have to compromise another vector. There are no free lunches. So consequence of this system is that RPM goes into stupid. What is stupid RPM? Any RPM that you can't use normal, uh, you know, steel bearings and again, even ceramic bearings will not work at that point in time. You have to have ceramically cooled bearings meaning you have to send oil to it to cool it. So that's above around 20,000 RPM. At that point, you might look into magnetic bearings. So the RPM on this puppy is very high. Now those puppy, the turbine system, steam turbine system, they are designed for very low RPMs, around 1500 RPM. Now why is that? Well, that's the another side effect. Uh, I'll explain that further, but be mindful. What if like this is five megawatt? What if you have to make 100 megawatt? It will become bigger, but still would be much higher. Like uh, I talked to the engineer, the engineer was like, yeah, if we are aiming for 100 megawatt, you're still looking at 10,000 RPM. So it's not going to be small. And you feel like, what if we put gearbox to step it down to normal generator RPM levels? Yeah, good luck finding a gearbox that can actually work. The gearbox they were working on because they were working on a small unit that was like around 10 kilowatt. The RPM was 60,000. Uh, that was stupid RPM and again the gearbox they literally were designing that RPM dropped from 60,000 to 20,000 still stupid so that's why the, the, that's the consequence that you are do, you're dealing with and yes you can achieve like many tabular oh, it will sh shear apart if it has that kind of torque have you looked into turbo pumps that are used in rockets that will make this look like a bro place bro like there are, we know how to build turbo machinery that are that powerful like jet engines inherently are that kind of powerful turbo machinery used in uh, basically rocket systems they will make this look like a uh, giant old thing so what is the consequence of actually having that high rpm there is no direct drive meaning this thing you have a shaft that has turbine you will have three stages of turbine like a small stage medium stage uh, basically high pressure medium pressure low pressure and all of that will be on one shaft and then you have generator at the end awesome but Yes, because that is doing direct thing, this hundreds of ton is acting as a stabilizer. So you have spin stabilization in your grid. That's why our grid works. That's the primary reason we have electricity. Simply because, think of this way. You do not call your power supplier. It's like, bro, I'm going to turn on water heater. Please add, uh, like, you know, uh, one kilowatt of extra power to your system. Because, again, there is no uh, battery system into grid. How the heck grid knows? Because, again, if you oversupply, it will destroy it. Undersupply, it will cause overheating and destroy equipment. So either it will cut off or destroy anything. So so supply and demand has to be matched very quickly. So how the heck you do that? You're not going to make a phone call like let's say a steel plant comes online. It's directly going to draw 10 megawatt. How the heck you stabilize it? You don't. You trust on inertia, meaning you add as much mass as possible. So hundreds of ton and all hundreds of ton are spinning. What happens? Let's say somebody turns on a huge load, huge as in like 10 megawatt or 50 megawatts. Now that load would be transferred through the transformer near them, the substation transformer, it's like magnetically coupling the energy is like coming, it's like stealing away from like the transformer, then the transformer steals away from the grid, grid steals away energy from the distribution substation, distribution substation, like it's magnetically being coupled. Where is the last stop? Last stop is the generator, the actual rotor that is providing the power. Now what happens to it? It starts to slow down, okay, energy cannot be created, not destroyed. So what happens to that slowdown? Because it has such a huge mass attached to it, it cannot just like, I'm slow. It's like it takes time. The higher the mass, the longer time it will take. And that time is enough for a computer to detect A, hey, something's off. All it will, so, uh, it will see from a computer's point of view, it will be like 1500 supposed to be the no nominal RPM. It will be like, uh, why the heck my RPM is 1499? Hmm, it's going down. 1498, 1499, uh, 1495, 
1490. It's noticing the moment it notices a trend, it's like okay, somebody has uploaded a huge load onto the grid. It will open a valve, increasing the steam pressure. That's why the RPM will be maintained to that upper 500 limit. You will never notice anything, and grid will be safe. And same thing works in reverse also. Somebody turns off a giant power load or a fault isolates a huge load. For example, a fault in substation directly removes uh, 100 megawatt of load. What happens? The turbine will try to speed up, so computer will notice from its point of view. It's like bro. 1500 is now 1501, 1510, 1520. It's like, okay, okay, turn off the steam valve. And that's why the frequency matters so much. And that's why like, nobody is like, uh, pain, um, you know, hateful of the fact that this is huge. We like that it is huge. We love this is huge. Uh, and that's how our grids are stable. So that is what we call spin march. You know, like whenever you talk about the people, there is inertia in the grid. That's the physical inertia. That's what you're, and because it's magnetically coupled, it saves us all. Either like you remove a load from it, it's like bro, it will try to spin up, but because of inertia, laws of physics, it's like it cannot just go like from 1500 rpm to like 10,000 rpm directly. It's like it will take time, and if time is long enough, and this when I'm talking about like computer detecting, it's happening inside a second, hundreds of a time. So computers are like bro, I got this. So there is no benefit of that in this. This is too stupid rpm. Now. Uh, Whenever we're talking about efficiency, that matters. Like again, even letting go of that uh, green energy would be acceptable if this puppy is actually efficient, meaning you are burning less coal. Again, coal is expensive. Natural gas is expensive, especially now, especially because of Putin. Uh, you do not want to waste of it. If you can get more power out of it by burning less of it, you will love to do that. But to achieve that, uh, the professor that was working on it, he clarified, yes, in principle, it can be done. But right now, we do not have the technology to make that uh, as of now is that that hot side could be like really really freaking hot like as in like right now we are trying 450 degrees celsius to 500 you are talking about 7 to 800 degrees celsius now can we have something that hot absolutely we have some steam plants that work at 1000 degrees celsius. so what's the problem well generally they are not working at stupid pressure this puppy is a high pressure and high temperature that's the consequence so that the fact that you have to be above 200 bar while you are heating that pup, uh, the engineer that are working on is like very clear. It's like, bro, I don't think steel can go to that extent. You may need titanium. And I'm thinking you may need to coat that with platinum in order to withstand the corrosive aspects. So that's the main con. Right now, the efficiency goal, the dream that we are thinking, that's very difficult to achieve. And then even if you right now, the, let's say the small baby model that you add that only gives you, let's say, 5% more efficiency, you're going to lose that efficiency getting from AC to DC to grid tie inverter. Because again, uh, the plants that they were showing, their experiments were using a reluctance motor as a generator and they were getting around 4000 hertz. Not 1 hertz, not 40 hertz, not 50 hertz, not 60 hertz, 4000. Basically, they were reaching a point where I have to say 4 kilohertz. That's too fast. The frequency is too fast. So the, the inverter will take some efficiency. Again, if you want to scale up to hundreds of megawatt, another aspect comes. Right now, there are no companies that can just mail order you, uh, you know, inverter that is 100 megawatt rated. It's not such a big demand that you're like, oh, there it is. There is such a demand in like solar farms, but solar farms have multiple small units tied together. So the biggest single unit I know is around 10 to 20 megawatts. Uh, I don't think, again, I could be wrong. Maybe some even higher voltage systems have come in online and they may single unit can handle 100 megawatt. But even if it exists, it would be idiotically expensive. That's guaranteed. So those are the consequences. And because of the, the fact that there is no place where it's like coming down, cooling down, the strain on the metal structures are high. Like again, it will take some serious toll. So that's the main consequence. The RPM is stupid and uh, you can't forget direct drive. You will not add inertia. Even though you have a spinning mass, you will not be able to add it. And again, inverter does not couple it properly. It has uh, transistors, it has fuses, it has inductors, it has capacitors to trying to, you know, limit those sort of magnetic coupling. So that's why. And again, magnetic coupling only works if you have direct drive. Even gearbox like big, will start to chatter a lot. So, uh, and again, like it would be very difficult. It's generally prefer to just have one shift. And again, even if somehow you can make it big enough where it is like, you know, RPM is very low and you're using dual pole generator that is like somehow giving you 60 Hertz or 50 Hertz, it still would be like the mass won't be there compared to a steam system. Mass won't be there. So that's the consequence that you are keeping up. So that's the bad. Is there a good? Absolutely. The biggest part is that all the components are small. This is a 10 megawatt handheld system. This is what the people say, tabletop system. Why does that matter? That simply matters because you can ship everything 
to a location using shipping containers. You do not need special permits. You do not need giant multi-wheeler trucks that are like, you know, takes a very long time to book takes millions of dollars and you have to plan out the road because you cannot go under the bridges or over the bridges you have to make sure everything is land traveled and good luck like it takes time effort and year almost a year just to transport a thing but if you have everything that can be broken down and put inside a shipping container it's like bro the train that is carrying your coal the next delivery is your uh, you know power plant delivery the turbine delivery that's awesome that's even though that's a small thing it matters a lot especially for new turbine constructions or uh, basically if you want to add it to industrial plants if you can just ship components there they're like shut up and take my money it's far, people are far more willing to accept things if they can actually get it rather than like yeah let me plan it oh no bro we, we have a very small link that is connecting this bridge to that bridge we can't really do that so that's why tra transporting everything in a small compact way is desirable then high temperature allows waterless heat uh, heat rejection that is very very desirable because otherwise let's say there are situation where some coal power plant was built uh, they ran out of water what they do sometimes if they have boatload of money boatload of space they will use this this is what we call air condensers and you can see this is a freaking crane <laughs> it needs huge surface area tons of metal in order to create and the fans are like freaking size of helicopters uh, so you need a lot of surface area just to condense that so if you have high temperature rather than like you know uh, partial vacuum and like almost uh, you know 50 degrees celsius if you have high temperature as in like 130 you, even small radiator can do that like this radiator won't be needed like like this is huge i did not even knew uh, like you can run a coal power plant almost in a like you know closed loop but that's the reason why this is not popular it's humongous idiotically expensive. the pipe itself is expensive and again not to mention because they're condensing it uh, they have to have an air pump that is sucking things out because it has to remain in partial vacuum because otherwise it will create a backfeed into the turbine system so that the fact that it can work without water is very critical like i specified in many uh, power plants especially in india had to shut down simply because of water scarcity same in china same in france even with the nuclear system simply because yeah the river ran dry and the nuclear power plants they need constant cooling so nope so that high temperature allows you to dump heat directly into the air without going through the water evaporation that's awesome and small mass and closed loop they have side effects, but they have the benefit that it's very quick startup and ramps. What does that mean? That simply means, uh, in principle, uh, how professor explained it to me, it's like very simple. Uh, steam plants could take around half an hour to hours to start up. It's like, okay, I'm turning it on tick to today. It's like Iron Man booting up sequence. This probably like quick turn around. That's how quick this puppy can be. And that's desirable. Many scenarios, especially why European Union is looking into it, they are very clear about this. Like we, we know that we're gonna go with majority of power with wind, some power with uh, solar. But they, we need something in between, something that can buffer the, you know, grid spikes. What can buffer that? Steam cannot actually buffer it because it does not like to change RPM that quickly. And again, turning it off is not an issue. Turning it on again is a very long issue. This puppy can bypass that issue. And this is the heat exchanger that uh, I was allowed to actually handle. I provided a video down below. That's that's how this heat exchanger was, was built basically. And this is used for like taking reject CO2 and uh, incoming preheat incoming CO2 using that. It's like surprisingly dense. Like I hold it in my hand, it was like dang, dense. So there are serious pros with this. Like yes, there are consequences, but there are genuine benefit. Like especially again, if you can't afford this, you have to do this. And again, like I do not even want to imagine how many trucks you have taken to deliver that. Like the pipe section alone would be tedious. And I be my foot pipe have to be very high uh, thickness. Not only it has steam, it has low pressure steam. So meaning atmosphere is trying to collapse the tube. So oh, this sort of diameter atmosphere is trying to collapse you. Whew, it, it will be thick, even though you may think, oh, it will be thin. If you have minus pressure there, minus as in like, a, uh, let's say rather than instead of 15 PSI, you have five PSI, 10 PSI pressure is trying to crush you in. So you have to make it thick. So you understand that even, even though we can do that, that's why we don't do that. So there are genuine pros with this technology and efficiency can be made to that extent where it's like 20% higher than steam system. Not right now, but can be done. So what we can expect in the future? Well, reality is it's a compulsory technology where we are running out of water. I specified for either, but simply example, many times coal power plant have to do partial shutdown during drought sessions or sometimes permanent shutdown because they uh, did not uh, like they drained the underground reservoir. This is like a Italy, Italy is they are dealing with this. Every country is now realizing we cannot just let water go like that. That's not acceptable. You cannot just let water go. So all of us have to look into this for that exact reason.
again small scale makes it easy to deploy meaning if i give you this amazingly amazing technology but it will take like freaking uh, one year just to, to transport and god god knows how much money it's going to take to like figure out okay this road this uh, bridge this truck crew this uh, you know chief and like insurance policy and all that you're not going to do it but this you won't even notice it it's just like hey one train came extra if i yeah that train has it remove it the box container that is very awesome and it does need some fine tuning for maturity right now can you brute force build it yes uh, will it last we don't know that's why we do we cannot classify this as a mature technology it's not something where it's like oh the steam turbine has been running continuously for 10 20 years we don't have that it does need maturity however nothing in the core level is something what we can unsolvable it's not like fusion where it's like we don't actually know why the heck you know uh, neutrons are not colliding we don't know we don't know like why the heck you know two nucleuses are getting love married and making love together it's like every neutron is at and every time they dodges each other they dump their energy using x ray photons or gamma ray photons we don't know why that's happening but it is happening and its reactor is not working here it's not like that it's a technology that exists supercritical co2 may sound a new thing but we have been using it in food industry for decades so it's a known technology every component of the system is known that's why i specified turbo expander it's a thing that gas industry uses like single shaft and sometimes they use it for energy recovery sometimes they use for many things and uh, you can see like they, they can replace it with generator they can replace it with a blower that's up to you that's why i specified every core component of it it's available like you can just buy it yeah they may not not be designed for same pressure level same temperature level but core tech is there it's like yeah you little bit of elbow grease to you know get it working like of course you're not going to try to use aluminum for your heat exchanger your temperature is too goddamn high it will become elastic at that temperatures so will you stay in steel and again if you want to if you have to use something very high uh, heat you may figure out how to make titanium heat exchangers again physics does not stop you engineering is just like costly not unsolvable let me be very clear every component in the chain is solvable and this opens up like the professor was not interested at all at like energy production side but he was interested in energy recovery and his explanation was very simple steam is a very mature technology okay and it does have the fact that it's a direct flash it does have a fact that it stabilizes your whole grid meaning you have hundreds of wind farm uh, thousands of solar farm and you have one of this this one of this like bro i got this this is the reason why your grid is stable so i do get his point but uh, his focus was like on energy recovery why we are wasting energy lot of energy like think of this way if we can recover even a small percentage of it like which european in second goal uh, is that if we can capture even small waste um, amount of wasted in, in metal plants cement plants things of that nature you are talking about serious power reduction in industry that will reduce our load meaning right now everything in our load is like how much megawatts we need it's keep going up if we actually start to do heat recovery it has the potential to actually curve it down while not affecting our like you know uh, you know quality of life it will actually make it better simply because if you can produce steel uh, and you are recovering a lot of energy that would be wasted that reduces your running cost and that means more profit means better quality of life better gdp growth so there's a lot of scope but that scope will only be possible if we finalize materialize and uh, this co2 system so there's a lot of options that we can do so from a technological point of view i think in next one to two but again it does need a bit of elon musk kind of figure where it's just like brute force this to work now again it will not work in mark 1 it will not work in mark 2 by mark 3 and mark 4 we're like okay finally we got it finally it's working for let's say one to two months without breaking then we'll reach a point where like okay finally it has been working for years without breaking then we're like okay decades without breaking it will take time but somebody has to be like that just brute force it because we know the core tech is there we know the science is there we have made small scales we have to just like bite the bullet somebody has to do that if we don't we all suffer because again water we are running out of water so this was my presentation on co2 supercritical hands on experience hopefully you have liked it learn from it in that case please click the like button share it among your friend that will help me a lot if you didn't like it didn't enjoy it i urge you to press dislike press it twice to show me extra disappointment please leave a comment because i do try to reply to all of them subscribe press the bell icon if you are free and as always thanks for watching